Hello modelers, it's Brian here at Hobby Link Japan uh, with another episode of Boss Builds sponsored by uh, Hobby Link Japan. And uh, last episode, uh, as you saw, we were working on the tracks and the running gear of the Fujimi 172nd scale Type 10 main battle tank. Uh, and the last episode I promised that I'd have the little guy done for this episode and voila, he is done. I stayed up uh, pretty late last night putting it together. It took about three and a half hours of work last night. Uh, to get to this stage, which is completely assembled. There's nothing else to put on here now. Um, plus the hour and a half I spent uh, last week with the runners, so we've, uh, with, the, with the track, so that's about five hours worth of work into it so far. All right, now here's the finished Type 10 main battle tank from Fujimi in 172nd scale. You can see it's pretty small. Here's a big hand to compare it with. Um, I spent about three and a half hours on it last night getting it to the finished stage. Uh, as you remember last time we put the running gear together and the tracks and all that and that was about an hour and a half so I've got about five hours invested in this little guy uh, to date. Um, now I don't know about you but I always like to mount um, my models, tanks particularly, on uh, some sort of a base. Now this is a base, it's from a 143rd scale uh, Cadillac uh, model that uh, I've used here and I just basically screwed it on there with a, a nice black wood screw. Um, particularly when you're done with it and you don't want to handle it and get fingerprints on it or whatever, uh, it's a good thing to do. And also for traveling, it's good. You can just throw it in a box and it doesn't bounce around or anything like that. So first thing I'm going to do is get it off of here so I can show you. Now which way do we go? Okay, there we go. Uh, it's just a screw holding it in there. I had to use a bit of a bushing to uh, get it to fit all the way on there. And off it goes. Take the screw out, or it falls out as it will, and there we go. So here is a little dust in there. Ooh, big chunk of dust. Uh, there is the final finished version, totally assembled Type 10 main battle tank in 172nd scale. Now, 172nd scale I don't often build. I prefer 135th or larger if possible. Uh, but this is the only kit available of the Type 10 right now. Well, actually, there is a 1 144th scale uh, resin kit of the Type 10, actually the TKX prototype version, uh, which would be about half this size, and so just no, no, I can't deal with it that small. Uh, it's a great kit, though, and if you like 1 144th scale, it's a way to go. Uh, but this was a very detailed kit, uh, and in 1 72nd scale, that means lots of little teeny tiny parts. Uh, for example, uh, the light guards and the light apparatus on the front, uh, the towing uh, shackles here on the front. Um, all these details are separate parts. Uh, I'm not sure what this is. The siren, perhaps? Um, this is the, the driver's hatch visual apparatus there. Uh, now, all the tools come already molded on here. There's a shovel, an axe, a sledgehammer, um, some other tools on here. Uh, they're already molded on, and thank goodness for that, because it would be hard to handle in this tiny little scale. And they look good. Even though they're molded on, uh, they're not, the detail is not bad there. Um, as I mentioned in the very first episode, I was expecting to have some breakage using you know, these big meat hooks I have, trying to build a little tiny model like this. And I was happy to, I'm happy to report that I really didn't break anything except for the one that I actually predicted was the tow cable that is attached to the back here. Very, very fine, very, very thin part. Uh, and while I was trying to clean off the burrs, you know, when you snip it off the runner and uh, leaves the little extra piece of plastic on there, I was shaving that off with uh, a knife, not unlike this one, and ka -chink! Broke that little sucker right in half, but, uh, you know, it's plastic, you can glue it, so it all went back together with no problem, and once I get some paint on there, you'll never know it was broken. Um, some other things to talk about, if you recall, uh, I had some problems getting the tracks lined up in the back, here and uh, I mentioned that the mud flaps would probably cover that up and when it's sitting normally yeah you won't see it uh, but you can still see it a little more than I had hoped so I'll probably try to go in here with a little bit of putty or some super glue or something and just uh, try to straighten out the there's a bit of a seam in there that I don't like I want to take care of that um, other points on the hull uh, well one point I can mention is the fit was excellent on this kit uh, as you might recall from the earlier episodes, the side panels are separate pieces, and then the top, and then uh, there's three pieces actually that go on the back. Uh, so I was a little concerned that it might not all line up uh, well, uh, but it went on beautifully the first time, no seams, uh, everywhere is great. Uh, I did have a slight bit of a problem with these front mud guards. Uh, how it's supposed to actually fit on there is a little ambiguous looking at the instructions, uh, so I had to refer to, as we've shown earlier, 
uh, this great book here. It's got some excellent photos uh, and diagrams on it, so I was able to check that out and see exactly uh, what the, the relationship of uh, these mud guards to the you know the, the side fenders and the front and all that were, and I think I got them on there fairly close to uh, the real vehicle. Um, but other than that, the the hull, chassis, running gear, and all that uh, went together pretty much without a problem, other than it being really really tiny, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, now let's go to the turret. The turret had the most parts, well, aside from the running gear and all that. Um, very detailed machine gun with the, the muzzle brake is, is bored out there already for you with the slide mold technology. Uh, so you don't have to worry about trying to drill that out as with the main barrel. Uh, it was also drilled out already by, with the slide molding process. Um, now one thing all tank models have to do if they're using the plastic barrels of their tanks is sand off the, the parting line seams. You know, the models are made with molds, of course, and wherever the molds come together will generally leave uh, a slight line that you can see. And um, my technique, like probably most of your techniques out there, is I just take a little uh, loop of sandpaper, just put it on there, and just roll it around, roll it around, being careful not to distort the actual shape of the barrel. Because um, if you just like, went on one side to try to sand the, the line off there, then of course you'd have a flat spot and the barrels um, most barrels don't have flat spots on them like that. Uh, so just went around here a couple times like that, uh, took care of the seam. It wasn't very pronounced from the beginning, so it was really easy to get rid of. Um, other points about the turret, uh, you have a choice of either hatch open or hatched closed, and that's a separate part actually because the, the actual hinge mechanism is a little different. Uh, apparently it moves on the real, the real thing. Um, so I showed it hatch closed because it doesn't come with figures and there's no interior, so uh, just button it up. It looks better that way. Um, some other very delicate parts were these little guards here for the uh, wind sensor device, which is shown in the, the up position here. Uh, it can also be shown down um, just by gluing it down, but I put it up. Every photo I've seen of uh, this vehicle to date shows it in the up position. That means it's in action, so uh, I put it up. And now this was quite difficult. These small parts like this and, uh, of course, the rope in the back, and the light guards and things like that. Uh, once you snip them off the runner again, you need to take care of the little burrs on there. And with tiny little thin parts like this and with big hands like this, it's not that easy. Um, so, so oftentimes I'll go ahead and put it on, glue it on there, and then once it gets dry, I can get in here with an X-Acto and do a little scraping along like this. These probably actually need a little bit more like that. Um, and again, since it's supposed to be a round part, you've got to be careful not to just scrape, scrape, scrape on one side of it because then it'll flatten it like that. So you've got to be careful to go around then finally get in there with a little bit of sandpaper and uh, clean it up. So I think I still need a little bit of cleaning up to do there. Uh, the basket. We talked about the basket in the, in the first episode. Uh, this is a little stowage basket in the back there and you put all their stuff when they're traveling on the road, you know, get their coolers and all their stuff back there. Uh, equipment, that is. Um, this was not difficult, but not particularly easy either. Uh, the fit is fine, but it's a little fiddly. And again, when you have big hands like this, getting it all lined up and all the parts together is a little difficult. Uh, and the instructions, Fujimi has you build the whole basket separately and stick it on there. Uh, but I thought it would be easier to build the, uh, put these side pieces and the bottom piece on, then put that on the turret, and then worry about getting the back part on there all lined up. And uh, eventually I got it on there and I think it looks pretty good. Uh, the bars might be a little thick for the scale, but again, this is 172nd scale, uh, so maybe in the future someone will come out with a photo etched part uh, for, or set for this kit, and uh, that would really make this basket look a little more in scale. Uh, but this doesn't look too bad. Um, let's see. Oh, one thing we can talk about at this point is I keep talking about how small this kit is and how tiny this kit is. Uh, now, I had... Um, my first child was born about a year, nine months ago. I haven't built a model in about two years, so this is the first time I've really gotten down uh, to sit down and build a model. Uh, and one thing I noticed is, at the age of 48 years now, um, the eyes. The eyes! I was trying to build this little thing and trying to get in close, and it's like, fuzzy, can't see, back up, back up. Okay, now it's in focus. It's too far away. I can't see it. Ah, so, to the rescue, my little portable magnifying glass here. Now, it can, you can hold it like this and do like this, but I found this to be a little cumbersome, although I did, did do some like this. Uh, what I mostly did, though, is I'd have a little tiny part. For example, we'll say this is the tiny part I'm working on. Uh, you know, I'd get in close and see where the problem is. Uh, 
Then I'd pull away and I would just remember where that was and I would dead reckon. I could still see, of course, but it's a little fuzzy and I'd just get in there and scrape away, scrape away, check again, you know, scrape away, scrape away until I was satisfied with it. Um, and then I would use my super duty Tamiya super pointy tweezers, pick up the little parts and uh, put them where they needed to be. And of course I would you know, check with this again to make sure the alignment is right. Ooh, look at now, I can see that there's some, still some things I need to clean up on this this part of the tank. Um, ah, so that is how I've been dealing with my uh, lack of, what is it, close-up vision? Does this mean I'm nearsighted or farsighted? I've never had glasses my entire life, uh, so this was a bit of a shock to start working on the model to find out like, oh my god, I can't see it. It's too small. Um, which is probably why I won't be building too many models in 172nd from this point on, but uh, uh, until there's a model uh, in 135th of this particular tank, this is all we have. So that's, I want, that's why I wanted to build this. I was really interested in the tank. Uh, so, tiny little parts, big hands, eyesight going, uh, but there are tools available to help you get around that. Uh, they even make uh, like visor type magnifying lenses that you can put on uh, to use. I might look into that or just heck, a nice pair of bifocals might even work reading glasses just to get in closer. Um, another tool I used to help move around the tiny little parts is this dental pick. Um, I don't even remember where I got this. It might have actually been from my dentist back in the States. Uh, you can, a lot of modelers, they go have their, uh, their dentist and they say, hey, you got any extra dental tools? Because dental tools are very handy uh, for, you know, once you get a part on there for moving it around, uh, adjusting the fit of some things. Um, I'll even show you how I used it to help with these antennas in a minute. So, um, I got the kit together, uh, it looks pretty good, the fit is great, uh, it's tiny and fiddly, but with some patience uh, and fortitude, you can get it together. Um, as I mentioned in the very first episode, the only thing that I was going to change with this particular kit is, was the antennas. The antenna was molded as a one-piece all-plastic affair, it was short and stubby, very thick, uh, so those had to go. So, what I chose to do is, as you see here, uh, I used 0.3 millimeter brass rod. Um, all I did was snip off uh, the area where I wanted to on the antenna, um, cut off the length of a brass rod I wanted, sanded the edges so they were round and not crimped up looking, um, and then drilled out the holes here. Uh, so, to show you how I did that, first of all, I, I cut these things off and I used the dental pick to start, and also I was using the, uh, the magnifying glass too, because who can see this? I used this to start a little hole there, and then I used this handy dandy little, we call these pin vices, I forget what they're called in English actually, pin vice, little tiny drill, this is also from Tamiya, uh, and using this, I kind of sat like this, and I uh, didn't have the, this part glued onto the tank at that point, but I was holding it and I would just drill out the hole, uh, gut it in about five millimeters or so, just enough to be able to glue it in there, and just stuck the brass rods in there and bam, done. I think it looks great. Now if you look at the real tank, the antennas do have a bit of a taper from the base to the tip, uh, which you don't get in the, um, with the brass rod, but I think in this scale it looks fine and it's sturdy. You know, they won't bend or snap off. Well, they'll bend if you put a lot of pressure on them. Uh, but anyway, I think uh, this you know, simple addition to the kit uh, really improved the detail and made it look a lot more realistic. Uh, now another thing you can do, and we've had some comments about this if for making antennas, and uh, people have been doing this for ages, is stretching some sprue. Uh, you can use stretch sprue to make uh, antennas, which we're going to show here. Uh, wiring, uh, anything that you need long and thin is where stretch sprue comes in. So here's a runner from the kit that we were building. I'm just going to whack off a piece here, bump, bump. Uh, now the key to stretching sprue is timing and technique, of course. Um, I don't pretend to be a master of this. Uh, whoops, well, we'll find that later. Uh, but um, I usually just use these little candles. I'm not even sure where I got this. I've had this for years to, to stretch the sprue that I have stretched in my time. Uh, and essentially, you just want to hold it over here. I rotate it around, a little nice rotisserie action. Spinning it around, spinning it around, and I'm, I'm feeling how it's getting a little softer in the middle there. Yeah, you don't want to get too close because you don't want to burn. Okay, see, it's getting a little wiggly. We're getting a little wiggly here, um, gonna get a little softer, a little softer, come on baby, a little softer, and I'm pulling a little bit already and blowing on the candle, and I got some sprue to, sprue to stretch, and that's about as far as I'm gonna go with this one, now I'm just holding it a minute, nice and taut while it cools, I'm gonna go ahead and blow out my candle, <laughs> try again. 
we're done there. All right. Now, all I got to do is go in here and I will nip it off there, nip it off there. And now what I have here is a nice piece of stretch sprue. If you can even see it, I can barely see it due to the aforementioned eyesight problems. Um, it tapers, you know, it's thicker on these ends and it tapers as it gets to the middle. So if you want like a long continuous piece of sprue, you need to uh, soften up a little bit more and get a long stretch. Um, but this is good for antennas because it's, again, it's a little bit tapered. So essentially, if I went like from here to here, this is actually a nice little antenna. Hmm, I might rethink this and replace my brass with these. But maybe not because I've already super glued those on. So there you go. Sprue stretched. So there it is, folks. Uh, the assembled, completely assembled Type 10. 172nd scale main battle tank. Uh, next time you see me here with this thing, um, I'll have it painted. So let's talk a little bit about how I'm going to paint it. As I mentioned before, I'm going to prime the whole thing in black uh, using my airbrush, uh, getting up into all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, priming it in black gives you a good base to set up a, a good uh, contrast between light and shadows when I use the colors to paint the main thing. Um, and speaking of the main colors I want to use, I've got two choices right now. Not sure which way I'm going to go yet. Uh, there are the, the Tamiya acrylic colors in GA type dark green and GA type brown. These are specific colors for this exact tank. Uh, but these are in non-toxic, very safe, non-stinky acrylic paints, uh, which are uh, really fun to airbrush and they don't stink up your whole house. Now I also have some lacquer paints from Gunze Sangyo and the Mr. Color line. This is also dark green and brown for the uh, self-defense force GA type tanks. Uh, but again, this is lacquer. It's very stinky. Um, it'll, if, you, if you have wife and kids in the house, they will not like this. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm kind of leaning on the acrylics. Uh, although, to be honest, I actually like the color. This is a little darker uh, than the Tamiya colors. And although acrylics tend to dry a little darker maybe, but we'll see. Uh, I might do some testing to see which colors I actually like better. Um, or actually I can just add uh, some black or white uh, to these to lighten them up or darken them up as I see fit. Uh, so it's only a two-color camo, and I'm going to airbrush all that. Uh, I'll put down the darker color first, and then I'll um, just hand brush. I will try to hand brush first uh, with the airbrush, uh, the camouflage pattern. It's a pretty simple pattern, big wide patches of the two different colors. Um, so that'll be next time uh, when you see me. I'll have it uh, primed, and I will probably have uh, the two primary base colors on. And then after that, we'll talk about weathering. Okay, folks, that's it for this week's episode. Uh, I'll be back in about two weeks, and I will show you painting the Type 10 Battle Tank. But and there's no way we could let the fans wait two weeks before I showing thought... something. Hey. Remember oh, this? Yes, the LFA. Remember this? Yeah, I've been working on my, uh, been working on my LFA here. Excellent. And uh, next week, it looks like we'll be able to do, uh, after your segment, we can do uh, my latest segment, which will be about painting, as promised. But just to prove that things are actually in progress here. You can see I've been hacking away at this Ooh. thing, and... And here we are, here we are. Check it out, we've got, uh, we've got engine, we've got all of the, the internal suspension stuff done. Moved it. Uh, all, of the, all, of that under, all of that underbody stuff. There's a lot of parts in this. Looks like it. This is yeah. a very, very detailed kit, and I kind of knew that when I got started, but yeah, this is, uh, this is taking a little bit longer than I, I kind of wished and, uh, and hoped, but it's, it's coming out pretty nice, I think. Looks yeah. good, looks very good. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll see some of the painting techniques in our next episode about, about uh, the basics of how to make something look like that. Yes.